31-year-old man who admitted to killing victims in his apartment, then dismembering their bodies, may have murdered up to 17 people. A serial killer is on the loose in the Daytona area. Investigators are on the trail of a possible serial killer. A stunning claim from an accused killer awaiting trial in Pennsylvania. And authorities believe they could very well have a serial killer in custody. And they say it may be the work of a serial killer. An accused serial killer in on this segment, we take a closer look at Harvey Lewis Cargan, also known as Harv the Hammer, also known as the Watt Ed Killer. I have two murder convictions. I'm guilty. They sent me to prison. Fine. I'm not trying to paint myself as, a, as somebody that's good or somebody that's that's uh, been totally taken out of aspect or uh, perspective or anything like that. I've done a lot of wrong things. I really have. You know, and I freely admit them, and uh, I'll, I freely admit that I should have done time in prison. That the things I did, uh, that I should have done time. Harv was an extremely strong, violent serial killer and rapist. He was guilty of raping and killing at least five women, and is suspected of doing the same to at least 18 to 50 more. He often referred to himself as an instrument of God and one who was acting under his personal instructions. When I interviewed him, was the enormous strength that this man showed me by chinning himself with one arm up and down the, uh, from hanging the, from the bars from the top of the cells uh, for an hour and a half to two hours, first one arm, then the X. I ain't got much life left. You know, maybe if I live to be 85, I've got, uh, what, 17 years. If I got, if I live to be, uh, 75, I've got about six years, you know, so I do want to get out. Man's very dangerous. Uh, he should never be let out. Uh, somewhere, something has caused in his lifetime to, to pick on a certain element of our society, a certain uh, age group. And uh, in one time in court, he talked about God told him to rid the world of harlots that these girls walking the streets were prostitutes, if you will. He said the reason why he was against women, uh, women in general was that his mother was a whore. And while he was a young boy, he caught her in several acts of uh, uh, having uh, sex. And she would beat him up when he found her. And he, he began to hate his mother. And uh, that's why he said that God had instructed him to get rid of these women that were whores that he was only doing God's work. He received his main nickname, Harv the Hammer, because of the chosen method in which he murdered, which was hitting his victims repeatedly with a hammer. And then, sometimes using that same hammer, he got that second nickname, the Want Ad Killer. He even advertised for help in a newspaper. He was known on, mostly on the West Coast as the Want Ad Killer. Uh, he would put want ads in for a job. Harvey was born May 18, 1927 in Fargo, North Dakota. He was out to a rocky start as he was undersized and compared to the other boys the same age. By the age of 11, Harvey was still bedwetting and he developed a problem with stealing. As well as he had a childhood condition called chorea, which is a disorder characterized by shaking and twitching of the face, legs, hands, and a steady jerking motion. This condition was the foundation for Harvey's social awkward upbringing, that would soon negatively affect his development, so much so that he was sent to reform school. As Harvey continued to develop, he made claims of being sexually abused by the female employees at that reform school. No one believed his accusations, and it just further ostracized him from those around him. So much so that as soon as he could, he enlisted in the U.S. Army to escape. Even the people stationed with him in the U.S. Army found his behavior strange and odd. Then on July 31st, 1949, while stationed in Fort Richardson, Alaska, Carrigan raped and killed a 57-year-old Laura Schultwalter, where she died from several blows to the head. Less than two months later, Carrigan attempted again to rape a Dolores Collin, but she escaped after fighting him off. She told police that she had been approached sometime around 7 a.m. by an intoxicated soldier. And there were other eyewitnesses that actually identified Carrigan and later identified him in a lineup to get him arrested. On September 17, 1949, Carrigan was brought to the U.S. Marshal for the murder of Laura Schultzwalter, where he then confessed to her, her murder, and he was sentenced to death by hanging, 
However, his lawyers filed an appeal with the Supreme Court, and Kerrigan's confession was ruled uh, illegal due to an overzealous police officer. So on April 22, 1960, he was released on parole. And the very first time uh, he was arrested in Alaska for murder, he was sentenced to hang. He was released on a technicality. Once out of prison, he moved to Seattle, Washington. And although he was free, Kerrigan was consumed with rage. Rage against society, but more so rage against women. It took a little while, but inside Harvey Lewis Kerrigan, it would all begin to build up. And he would go on this horrific killing and raping mutilation spree. The awkwardness from his youth continued to plague him until the stresses of everyday life built up and built up until 1972, where Harvey popped. On October 15, 1972, 19-year-old Leslie Laura Brock of Bloomingham, Washington was found dead. She died from what appeared to be several blows to the head that would later match the ammo of Harv the Hammer. There was only some good news that the, there were some witnesses that claimed that they saw her getting into a silver truck, a very similar truck to the one owned by Harvey Lewis Carrigan, and he, which he drove at the time. Then on May 1st, 1973, 15-year-old Kathy Sue Miller answered a help wanted ad that Carrigan placed for a service station that he was leasing at the time. When the girl showed up for the ad, he sexually assaulted her and killed her. Her body was found months and months later by two boys hiking on an Indian reservation, some sort of uh, outdoor area north of Everett, Washington. She was naked, bubbled in plastic, wrapped in that sheet, and had beaten with a hammer over and over again, leaving nickel-sized holes in her skull. Mentioned the uh homicide in Seattle, where he, where he was running a gas station at that time. And uh, he was accused of killing a girl that uh, applied for a job there. And they found her body in a, in a plastic bag near his gas station. And he kind of joked about it. He liked to, it was kind of a game. By May of 1974, Carrigan moved to Minnesota and began living with Ellen Hunley, a woman who he picked up hitchhiking. There were some members of some sort of strange cult. She then disappeared on August 10, 1974, and her rotten corpse was found five weeks later in Shelbourne County. Her skull was imploded all across every side, with force blows savaged by a claw hammer. She had also been raped by a tree branch. Also killed his girlfriend, Eileen Hunley, who was living in Minneapolis at the time, and they were in a group called The Way, it was kind of a religious organization. And she, according to Harvey, was engaged in sexual activity with... Uh, one or two or three, I don't recall, men in the back of a van, and Harvey become quite upset with it. And subsequently took her life and took her up into Sherburne County, again in a rural area, and drove in this long field off of Highway 169 and placed her body in the woods. Although Harvey was keen on murdering, there were at least five other incidents where his victims would escape or he would let them go for some strange reason. Like in the case of Gwen Burton in September 14, 1974, where Harvey found Gwen in a Sears parking lot having car problems. He approached her and then ripped her clothing off, choking her into semi-unconsciousness. Then he sexually assaulted her with the hammer, and he dumped her body in a nearby field and assumed she was dead. But she survived, and sooner or later was able to crawl to the roadside for help. How can these young girls that survived, the survivors of the Kerrigan uh, onslaught, uh, they claimed when the uh, Harvey would take and grab him by the head, force him to give him oral sex. And during the course of the oral sex, he would take his hammer and beat them into the head and knock him into unconsciousness. And after that, he'd throw him into the ditch like so much uh, refuse. And uh, you can imagine the, uh, the strength of this man, the huge man he was and uh, they strengthened his arm to beating these girls in the head with a hammer. It's, it's horrifying. An ill-conceived insanity defense involving messages from God did not impress the jury at all. Carrigan's trial for attempted murder of Gwen Burton in March 1975 then convicted him of that murder, and he received the maximum of 40 years in prison. Since no criminal in Minnesota may be sentenced to a term exceeding 40 years, all of the other trials and all the other sentences equaling 150 years were merely just window dressing. He would only receive the 40 years. And the case were of the nurse, uh, Gwen Burton, uh, she was having car problems in the Sears parking lot in Chicago on Lake Street. And uh, she had her heart up, and he come along and said he could have fixed the car for her, but he'd have to go home and get the uh, tools. 
And uh, once he got her in the car, he took her out uh, to Carver County, where he uh, uh, attempted to have, uh, have her have oral sex and then he beat her. And uh, she, uh, uh, she survived and it was her, really her identification of this man and of the automobile that, that was the best that uh, we had had that uh, eventually led to his arrest. By this time, police in Minneapolis were already talking to their counterparts in Washington, exchanging notes and going back and back, back and forth. And then within days, survivors started coming out and picking Carrigan's photo out of a lineup system, which they identified as a man who abducted and assaulted them and has been doing assaults for the past two years. This then to, read to his arrest on September 24th, 1974. Upon the arrest, a search of Carrigan's possession revealed a map of 181 red circles drawn in isolated areas all over the United States and Canada. Some circles indicated places where he had applied for jobs or purchased vehicles, but other of the circles that were there indicated strings and strings of unsolved homicides and rapes and assaults of women. Some of the circles, however, were just plain nothing. So he said. When Detective uh, Searles and officers Nelson and Thompson went through the automobile when they first arrested Harvey Ham or Kerrigan. They found a map in the car, and then this map it had 143 marks or circles from uh, Ohio, from Cleveland, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, all the way up to westward, up through the Oregon, Washington, California, up to Vancouver, and. Uh, uh, I know at one time there was over 50 that we confirmed that every place there was a mark, there was a dead body found of a young girl. Harvey Lewis Carrigan is still alive right now and is serving a sentence at the Minnesota Correctional Facility located in Bayport, Minnesota. Since no criminal, again in Minnesota, may be sentenced to a term exceeding 40 years, no matter what they do, Harvey is actually eligible for parole right now in 2015. But due to the severity of his crimes, he'll most likely die in prison. Then again, who knows? If you would like to attempt to write Harvey and to see what he and his hammer are up to, you can do so by sending a letter to Minnesota Correctional Facility in Stillwater. Inmate's name, Harvey Lewis Carrigan. MN Doc Offender ID 100736-970 Pickard Street, Bayport, Minnesota 55003. Dash 1490. Well, that sums it up for us on this episode of Five Minutes of Murder. I hope you enjoyed it. And remember, make sure you lock your doors and windows because you never know when your five minutes are going to be up.